What's up everyone, this is Marsman here, and welcome to Marsman Gaming. In this video, we break down the biggest gaming news of the week, and as always, I can't do it alone, I need the Marsman crew along with me. So, return making his epic return this week is Hockey. Yo, what's going on guys? And Langella Kill. What's up everybody? Now, this is the, actually the fifth episode of the Marsman newscast that we've been doing here, and it's been fun these past few weeks uh, because we've been going over the biggest news topics for each week and obviously as you all know whenever news things happen like there's always going to be ever-changing things that occur right in the world at the time so obviously we're trying to keep you up to date to the biggest topics that you should be focused on and we will give you the most insight possible with as much of our own opinions uh, as we can do and we, generally what ends up happening as well is that by the end of the video we usually like to have some discord questions which are from the mars band crew that are on our discord so please if you want to submit to us any type of question please join us on discord and that is located in the description below and as always if you like this type of content please drop a thumbs up and subscribe for more future content and hit the notification bell to be updated whenever you do a stream and or post but let's get started with the news, guys. The biggest thing that I, the feature topic of the week for me, is going to be the fact that we have a lot more information about the Resident Evil 4 remake. Now, it was a recently uh, was announced at the PlayStation State of Play, um, and that it's been shown that it's been in the works and it should be coming out March 24th, 2023, which is obviously a little bit less than a year from now. Obviously, the fact that you know it's going to be coming into the early spring of next year. And people are speculating about, you know, how much of the game is going to change because of the fact that the, the developer Capcom has announced that there will be changes happening in the game. And it may include some changes to the story, some changes to the game mechanics, voice actors, and even some dialogue. And they didn't go into specifically what things are going to be changing, but obviously hearing something to that area, a lot of the fans of the original game Resident Evil 4 we're also going to become very cautious because, you know, the game itself, the original, was such a classic that it might cause people to be upset that things are changing too drastically. So my big question, that my first one I'm going to ask you guys is, what do you think the most important thing that should be kept the same when making a Resident Evil 4 remake? And I know that, uh, you know, I'll go with Langella Kill here first. What do you think is the most important thing that should be kept the same when doing a remake or a redo of this Resident Evil classic? Um, I think the environment was really good. Uh, they definitely can't change up the environment. And I think they need to stay as close to the story um, as possible. I know that there will be some changes. How drastic the changes, I'm not sure. But again, we get into the part where when you remake um again you know there, there's mixed feelings on both sides like the people when they remake games are upset that it's a full price game but if they reinvent the game and it's not as good as the original that also gets a lot of pushback so you really have to walk a tightrope when it comes to remaking a game versus reinventing a game and a story and so this is going to be a difficult one but to me I, I always lean more towards staying closer to the original game if it's a classic game um because you have something to fall back on so to me the environment and the story are two very important aspects that i think they should keep close to uh from the original yeah Aki, what do you think what do you think should be kept the same from the original yeah so i mean i'm gonna piggyback off of, uh langella still here um if they're going to be changing the dynamics of the game, you know, like if they're going to be changing the dialogue, some of the mechanics, uh, I'm on the boat of why not just make a whole nother game, you know? Um, if it takes more time, it takes more time, but um, if you're going to change a decent amount of the game or how the game plays, um, you might as well just make another, uh, a whole nother game. So I, I like Langella Kale said, I'm going to stick to the, I'm, I'm going to stick with the core game. It needs to be, mechanically the same or right? it needs to play the same it needs to look the same um again i'm not for remakes just make a whole nother game yeah see my biggest thing and i can agree with both of you here but my biggest thing i look at is the characters i mean you you can't change leon to become something completely yeah. different because if you look at leon as a character resident evil 4 it was kind of that like resident evil 4's dialogue and character writing was cheesy but it was also like 
just cool and suave. Like, every character in that game fit perfectly to what the setting was, and then it made you love the characters because of how interesting and how diverse they were. And Leon himself was, like, the OG, like, legend because of his cheesy-ass dialogue, but he was just a good character. And that's yeah. why, I, even to this day, I, I cannot forgive the Resident Evil, like, redo of the show, of the of the TV series or, or movies, because they basically made Leon look like a moron. Um, and even though, like, it's just like, he wasn't that. He, he was a rookie, but he was not a moron. And Resident Evil 4 is what made people fall in love with Leon in the first place. So I think keeping consistent with the characters is probably the easiest thing for you to do because we've seen in other in other things, and a, a hint, I don't want to jump them into this conversation, but a Halo, the Halo show, that butcher characters cause people to hate every aspect of it. So keeping Leon consistent, if you want to change some aspects of the story, okay, but keep him consistent. Don't change him. Change, you can change some things to make it make more sense or adjust some things. That's fine in certain degree, but characters keep the same. Um, and, and, I, kinda, and I'm not against, I'm also not against, and I'll push back a little bit on what we said before. I'm okay with them changing kind of the mechanics of the game. Um, to make it a little bit more, you know, 2020, you know, 2022. Well, well, let's, I was just going to add um, into that because changing, like, what? so this could be what you would change. Like, yeah. you think, so you, so, pay, so keep going with that. So uh, my next question to build off that was what should be changed when making this yeah. game? So then kill. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people kind of like the old Resident Evil style where you have to stop and shoot um, almost like an arcade type game. Um, to me, it's not my favorite flavor. And if they want to make it again, they can keep aspects of it. But if they want to make it a little more smoother, um, a little bit more, you know, nuanced and kind of commonplace where we are today, I'm actually OK with that. I actually don't mind that at all. Um, similar to and it's not the same, but similar to Final Fantasy VII, um, the remake of that game where the, the play of the game was vastly different. Um, and I, I thought it was pretty successful in doing that. Now, again, it's not a, very easy to do, but, you know, Final Fantasy VII kind of changed the dynamic, made it more mainstream. And if Resident Evil 4 attempts that, I will not knock them, even if it fails. Um, I do think that is a risk that could be worth taking. Mm -hmm. So, Haki, what do you think should be changed? Um, so, I, I mean, I, I can, I definitely can agree with Frank. I think more of a run and gun situation would be okay but again i and i know you guys don't uh, or agree with me here changing the whole dynamic of the game uh is just not a way to go it's it's definitely a, a kind of an iconic series so um changing it too much is bad but yes definitely sprinkling in a little bit of that you know 2020 to 2022 gameplay or um you know updated version on the new gen uh xbox and playstation 5 um i think that would definitely be good yeah, so listen, I can agree, and I think updating gameplay makes more sense because of the fact that, like, like Langeo Kill said, and, and Haki you agreed, was that playing that slow pace, just stop and shoot type of stuff is not necessarily as popular anymore. Now, granted, I think like a Dead Space type of game, like it's reemerging with that protocol, Polisco protocol, like that that type of slow, like t intense, like anxiety filled horror games are are still kind of popular, but. I think Resident Evil getting that Resident Evil 8 Village, like kind of having the ability to maybe go into first person mode if you want to choose to do so, I think that'd be a pretty cool mechanic. I don't think force everyone to do that. I think that'd be bad because I think those homers that want to play with the classic feeling would hate that. But giving the ability to possibly go into like a first person mode, like vi like Village and how even uh, um, Resident Evil 7 was like having it first person that also makes it horrifying like some of the things that they would have in that game i think other things that some people mentioned was like create more variation with the enemies like i mean the classic resident yeah. evil 4 was like you had three enemies like three or four types of enemies like all the villages were essentially the same but just different faces right and then you had like the the, the dudes with the robes like they were all the same essentially so very make some variations on your enemies make sure the the gameplay is more updated to like a current audience and I think you'll be fine. I think that that's honestly not too difficult to do. And you're not going to be angering too many people that way. But changing too much, like where people are going to be like, let's change dialogue. Let's change. Let's change yeah. Leon to be more of a like, how, more like hockey said, you know, it is dangerous, right? To mm -hmm. make too many changes because now it's not 
a remake anymore. Let's make a new now game. A new yeah, let's make a brand new game. Yeah. And yeah. If that's what ma you make, want. make a make a sequel to Resident Evil Seven uh, Four and make it with like, a new Leon. Like that's fine. Th then do that. But don't. Yeah, like, I I listen. I agree with you both. There's like certain aspects you don't want to go too far. And this is just one of those. I just be like, just update the gameplay. I mean, like I I always felt, and I'll make this comparison. I always felt that if they took Metal Gear Solid Five, the Phantom Pain's gameplay, and put that with Metal Gear Solid Three, it and Metal Gear Solid Three could be one of the top five games of all time. Like just by story and gameplay itself, like that would be amazing. Metal Gear Solid Three has the same type of gameplay that Resident Evil Four has, where it's a stop, turn your body completely, shoot. Hopefully, you hit the guy, and then you're like, oh, I gotta keep running, and like you're Some like a blocking character. It. Some people love, people that love it. They love it, but I felt like if you make that more updated to be like Metal Gear Solid 5, which was like such good gameplay, the way that they set it up, where it wasn't too like run and gun, kill everything. It was more strategic, but it was, you could choose a first person point of view for certain aspects and then do it the you know, third person other ways. It was more secretive. That was perfect. And if you did it that way with Metal Gear Solid 3, that'd be, that'd be ideal. Same thing here. You just need to update some ways of mechanics. And then it'd be all right. Don't change everything. I think you're going to make a lot of enemies. And I could say the same thing. We, we'll talk about this game later on. But, you know, Star Wars, the the the, the, the Old Republic. Like, if they change that thing completely, everyone's going to hate it. Like, it, it's just something that just don't touch it. Um, well, let's move on, though. We got to jump to the topic number two. EA Sports has announced that college football has a return set for possibly July 2023. Um, so NCAA football has uh, has not been a thing since 2013. It's been basically a year before I graduated high school since the last time that this game was in existence. And you now back in the back in uh, back in the day, this was possibly my favorite sports game on the market. And in my opinion, I think it's better than Madden. I think a lot of people would say the same thing. They basically took a lot of the Madden mechanics from back in the day and then updated them and actually made it better. It was almost like they were the trendsetters for how Madden started to adapt some things like the, the really hard cuts. They actually were the first ones to do that. And then Madden kind of picked it up the next year. Some other things that they introduced were things like creating your own playbook first. NCAA did that first. Creating your own coaching scheme so you can create your scheme of like what you want to run on certain downs, down coaching in distance. Co just I was gonna, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a whole recruiting system for NCAA, which was so so good that it made the so game cool. and made it made the game replayable. Like I played like ten seasons, like and it was, and then like Langelico said, a coaching tree. Like they they just brought that back in Madden again after like a decade. And they're like, oh, we just we just created a brand new thing that has never been in, in existence. A coaching tree. NCAA thirteen had that w a decade before. Um, so it's it, it basically. Yeah, oh, well, in, yeah, in 14. So essentially, like, it was a long ass time ago that they had that in, in existence. And let's just be honest here Madden is hot garbage. Um, at the end of the day, people that were fans of NCAA football, including including me, including Legel Kill, Hockey, I'm sure you played it before. Um, but people who are fans of NCAA football are nervous because they're like, I don't want this game to become hot trash like Madden is already hot trash. So. The big question is, you know, one, do you think that NCAA Football 23 will be a good game? And let me jump uh, to Langell Kill first, since me and you have probably the most experience playing this thing. Do you think this game is going to be good, or do you think it's going to be hot trash? I love the NCAA. Um, again, it was one of my favorite sports games. But damn, am I scared. Not nervous. I'm scared of what they're going to do to my favorite franchise um in sports you know i was really excited when they first announced it um it wasn't last year it was a couple years ago mm -hmm. um that that ncaa was coming back and then when as time goes on and you think about it you're just like this could end up being a disaster um because ea is not the ea from ncaa 14. Yep. this is ea the grubby ea the microtransaction ea the you know uh the the 42, yeah. packs, packs yeah. of cards, packs, EA, ultimate team, all this, all this ultimate stuff, team, yeah. Yard BS EA, and if that is going to seep into NCAA, then it is just going to be a copy of Madden with college football sprinkled over, painted over this dead carcass that is the sports franchise. And that, to me, I'd rather the game be retired. If that's the case, now I just have a slim hope that maybe. 
EA will put in some effort because this is not a, again, this could go now year after year after year, but the first game could be pretty good effort because of the time that has been missed and that they can spend time working on this game. It's not like, okay, this is the 10th installment of Madden after, at Madden after Madden after Madden. So maybe, but to me, if I was going to put a percentage, 75% to me feels this will be a mediocre or bad game. Um, with 25% having hope. And it's just because I don't trust EA in sports games yeah. at this point. How can you? There's no evidence to show that, that they, they deserve any sort of trust. Games. Yeah. Uh, Aki, do you think it's going to be a hot trash game or not? Yeah, I mean, uh, NCAA, um, NCAA is probably the only football game that I, I think I might have bought it in high school. Um, but that's it. I mean, I, I'm just not a fan. I think it's very uh, repetitive, all sports games, 2K, Madden. I mean, the only one that I might have fun, again, just picking up would be NHL, you know, uh, just because mm -hmm. you can hit people and stuff and it's a little fun. But other than that, I think the sports games in general, they're just not my vibe, but um, NCAA was that one that was good and it was fun. Uh, mechanically, it was, I think it was much better than Madden. And at the time, yeah. Yeah, at the not, time, and it was just, it was just anything, fun. You know? There's just so much you could do. like. I, yeah. I always felt like the game, like the fact that like I could be a coach, I could be a defensive coordinator, and then do well, get right, and then get possibly get hired to be a head coach somewhere, and then like kind of start your own story as a franchise coach, right? Like yeah. that, cool. that is like that is already cool within itself. Like you could choose to do that, you could just jump to be a head coach, you could accept offers somewhere else. I remember playing like for ten seasons, and I jumped from being a D coordinator to a head coach back to the head co coach of my original school, and I won the NCAA, I won the NCAA title. Like it was just like such a cool idea but the second part of this i want to add on is if you were in aa shoes and we've been asking this question a lot on this on this newscast what would make this game successful and i kind of want to you know i i, I want to maybe think about this for a moment here but essentially what i want them to do is whoever's working on madden you guys cannot touch ncaa football like first off you guys we need to have a separate group of people that are working on ncaa football and that's it. And I think the other biggest thing they should do is change the formula and how they release football games. They should make it a live service game. And I know what you're saying. Live service, Mars. Why would you do that? Essentially, they're doing a live service every year and paying and making you and charge you $60, right? If you make this a live service game where you have all these functions built into it already and every season you have to pay a, like a, a cheaper amount of money to get an updated roster or any major updates that fix the mechanics, that makes more sense than what they're doing now, which you're paying $60 for a yearly release with a copy and paste mentality and it's just not beneficial. I think that would make NCAA at least more, you know, they, they, don't, they don't feel like crunch that you're paying it. Uh, $60 per release and this thing is not even worth the $60 price tag. Yeah, it's almost 70. yeah, it's, it's going to be 70 yeah. yeah, it's $70 for Madden every year. If they made a live service and they said, "All right, every season you're paying, you know, 10 to 15 bucks for the new new rosters and the new updated game that we have like added a new mechanic, whatever." That makes more sense. Now, granted, I don't think like, "Oh, if you do that, the game is a success." But I think that would make the 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 pain of buying a game that does not do well, at least less painful because you don't have to buy the season pass. You can just be like, you know what? I'm just gonna stick with this roster. I have a bunch of made up characters made in the in the in the recruiting process, and I'm just gonna roll with it instead of having a brand new group of people automatically sync to it. Um, and I think the biggest thing, in in my opinion, I'll, I'll I'll stop after this last thing. Bring back some of those things like recruiting. Bring back some of those things like coaching trees and just. Look at the old 2013 NCAA football and just if you're going to copy paste anything, copy paste that game. Like just have updated graphics, tackling, and then that's fine. Like I, I, I'm not saying that that's great, but it's a lot better than what Mad's producing at the moment. Um, so, Langella Kelly, I'll jump to you. I feel like I talked a lot here, but what do you think is something that would be needed to be successful for NCAA football? The best thing that the EA could do is get rid of the, their get rid of the stupid animated uh tackling, tackling software that they have but we know that's never going to happen um that would be and your idea is a good idea but that would require ea to be less greedy um which i also find to be impossible as well when it comes to sports games so i don't think either of ours ideas are going to happen but what i can say is i would love 
uh, NCAA to have an enhanced experience. You know, like you said, copy and paste. You know, I would be pretty disappointed if it's just a copy and paste. It's not the worst thing, but I would be disappointed. I want a in-depth recruiting. I want in-depth, you know, college environment type stuff. Um, obviously, we want the NCAA playoffs um, as part of the thing in bowl season and stuff like that. But I just want enhanced, you know, because they do such a terrible job in franchise mode um, for Madden. I want NCAA to have a kick-ass franchise mode. And I know everyone's going to be, you know, franchise mode is like kind of a niche thing. No, it's not. It, like, it's, a, it's the best thing. Yeah. franchise mode. And whether it's online, uh, local, whatever, like I want a kick-ass franchise mode. And you know what? Like if they're just going to spend all their time in ultimate tr- team for NCAA, that's my big fear. And, and so to me, a kick-ass franchise mode with in-depth recruiting, you know, in-depth college experience, having all, you know, as much different nuances when it comes to the playbook and like, again, you know, different animations because we have to use that stupid software. At least if we had a kick-ass franchise, we could tolerate the other BS. Yeah. So, Hockey, do you have uh, anything you want to add for this success? How, how do they be successful here? Yeah, so I, I uh, just like Angelica, I do like your idea of the live service game. Um because again, for me, it's just super repetitive. Um, wasn't worth 60 bucks for me. God, definitely not worth 70 bucks. Um, so- uh, well, Or $100 they, for that gold pack that has- yeah, uh, yeah, that's what yeah. I was gonna say. I'm definitely not 2042 in this. I'm not buying, I'm not even gonna be close to buying a, a sports game, even though it's, you know, bringing back NCAA, but I'm not gonna do it. You know, I'm gonna make sure, like my jelly feels that it has at least a, a, a good core, base for uh, everything that NCAA, NCAA had in 2013, which was, you know, recruit, recruiting, the coaching and everything. Uh, but I do like your live service um, idea. I think that would be better, you know, every six months paying 10 bucks or whatever to update your roster, or what, what have you. Um, you also did steal my idea. I was going to say that they need to buy an entire building <laughs> and just keep the Madden people away, just like a <laughs> whole building for the NCAA. <laughs> Like whoever's making the game, an entire building by themselves, have their own little swipe cards, and no Maddens get in. Yeah, Dude, yeah, it's it's pretty hot trash, and 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 I am not buy. I have not bought a Madden game. I I think two years. I think I bought one two years ago. I wanted to see how it was, and then I was like, this is so horrid, and I I stopped. Like it's it's bad. It's just bad. I think some of the things they they're missing out on, like stop you know, paying if, EA for Madden. Stop if. It. Yeah, yeah. let's just hope that the contract because here's the thing like i have to really look at the new contract for ncaa in the EA because it's a separate thing than the nfl nfl solely gave them the rights to make mad to make nfl games but ncaa is a different beast like they could they could technically make an offer to another another developer like 2k to make a game but 2k is also very grubby because they also do yeah. the same thing with 2k basketball and just yes. have a lottery and you're just getting card packed so yeah. So it's essentially the same thing, just a different face, right? Um, but let's jump to not <laughs> the next topic. Topic number three, and this one's probably going to be pretty short, but news here about Uncharted the movie will be coming to Netflix later this year, probably around uh, July of this, se- of this year. So really just less than a month, really. So essentially, this was the Uncharted movie that came out under Sony that had Tom Holland playing Nathan Drake and Mark Wahlberg playing uh, Sullivan. Uh, and essentially when you look at the amount of people who are showing up at the box office, it was, it was decent due to the popularity that Uncharted is as a game series. And it's a great game series. Um, the popularity of the game series brought people to the, to the movie theaters, but generally look at the ratings. I'm, uh, IMB and D, uh, IMDB had rated at 6.4 Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 40%, which is, you know, ugly rotten to me. I don't even know what the official ranking name is for it. Um, at, very much vomit um and metacritic gave it a 45 and metacritic basically takes all the critic scores from everybody and compiles them and gives an average so 45 average of their of the score um so quick question for everyone here are you gonna watch this movie me i'm not watching it uh and i'll give my reasons basically when i look at this movie they change characters they change the story they try to appeal to the fan service of uh, the original series but they kind of missed the mark. Um, Tom Holland seems like a guy who just doesn't age. He kind of seems like he always has to play a, 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 a teenage boy or a young college kid. And I can't see him doing anything else at the moment. Like he looks, he's Spider-Man. Like you're, 
Peter Parker and you're not aging ever. Like, I have not seen him age whatsoever. Like, Chris Pratt, seeing a guy like him that's, at least I saw him when he was on Parks and Recreation. He looked really young then. He gets older, more bristled, and now he's like Guardians of the Galaxy. I could see him age. Like, I've seen actors age and become more mature. Tom Holland Lily has not aged a single day since his first showing in Civil War, right? Like, he has not aged a day. And now you're having him play Nathan Drake. Yeah, you know what? He might have some charisma to, to give him that. And he's a good actor when it comes to Spider-Man. But he's not Nathan Drake. Um, and unfortunately, they missed the mark a long time ago when when trying to have some actors that, you know, kind of look more like Nathan Drake and kind of act like Nathan Drake more. Um, S Sullivan being played on Mark Wahlberg, it kind of just feels like they're just throwing names out there that were like, no, he's a big time actor. Let's just put Mark Wahlberg in there. And on top of that, they just don't look anything like any of the characters. So it's just like... It just makes people not like associate that with Uncharted. They associate this with just like a like it's like watching like the Super Mario Bros. movie and be like, that doesn't look like Mario and this Asian dude does not look like Luigi. So I'm not I can't associate Mario and Luigi with these guys. Like it does not make any sense whatsoever. Like so I'll get you guys to answer this one quick. Langella Kill, are you gonna go watch this movie? Um, I'm not running to Netflix to watch it. I think eventually you probably will. I mean, I have a Netflix subscription, so, um, but I'm not running to it. And you pretty much nailed the points. Um, I'm okay with giving actors shots. I thought this was a good opportunity for Tom Holland, um, to kind of pull out of the Peter Parker role, but he just, in my opinion, didn't come through, uh, based on everything we heard. And he did not connect as Nathan Drake and, and they didn't connect, Mark Wahlberg didn't connect as Sully, and you have two main characters not connecting. Um, it's tough. It's tough to feel like Uncharted. And that was the biggest thing. If you just went into the movie liking action, um, they said, you know, you enjoy it. Like, it's 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 a pretty action-y uh, type of movie. But if you're an Uncharted fan, it didn't really hit for you. And so, to me, I'm an Uncharted fan. I can imagine that it's probably not going to hit for me either. Yeah, I was an Uncharted fan too, and you can see my kind of not disgust, but kind of my my shock when I heard that Tom Holland was gonna be the was a Nathan Drake. I was like, like I know Sony, I get it. He's Spider Man, he's popular, but like you can pick somebody else. It doesn't have to be Tom Holland. Tom Holland doesn't have to be the Sony like star that just plays everything. He could be somebody else. So there's a lot of actors out there you can pick from. You know, like like come on now, like you know what I mean, like. Hell, I, as much as I know that this guy looks seems a lot older, but the guy who plays uh, in, in Mandalorian looks more like Nathan Drake than Tom Holland. Like, it, like I get it. You can spruce his face up a little bit, put some makeup on him, make him look well, younger. He's Joel. He's Joel now. He's yeah, but say he's Joel. But you like, you know what I mean? Like that. It's just like pick your pick your actors, man. Pick pick the guys who look more similar to your people. Which I actually like, think. I'm I think that's a better pick for that. I think for his Joel, Joel role might be a good but, one. I, I hope for his sake I hope so and I hope for for Sony's sake because then they'd be 0-2 in their movie selections for recreating games. Hockey, are you gonna go watch this movie? Uh so like my Angelica said I did I do have a Netflix account. Um if I'm doing absolutely nothing, I might watch the movie. We, we um, should we should have a watch through of the movie and just commentate now how how <laughs> iffy it is. A live a, reaction. A live yeah. reaction of it. Like I, again, I'll, I'll I'll probably watch it, you know, in the next few months. But um, so the thing is, I'm big with uh, Rotten Tomatoes. So me and my brother are always on Rotten Tomatoes when it comes usually to Marvel. Um, and I found some outliers, right? So um, usually, if the movie is bad, like bad, bad, both the you know there's a Rotten Tomatoes, uh, to, you know, tomato meter or whatever, and then there's a fan one. Usually they're within you know ten spots of each other. Uh, and, and that tells me that the movie was at least really bad or really good. Um, this one was like, you know, like you said, it was like 40 on Rotten Tomatoes, but the fans was 90. So that's a big outlier. That's a, you know, kind of a big mix up. So again, I'll take a look at it. I, I don't think it's going to be, you know, fantastic, but the fans being in the nineties and the critics being the forties does give you like a weird vibe of really what happened. I'll make, I'll make a good, a good, good comparison to that. Star Wars: The Last Jedi had a 90, meta, uh, 90 Rotten Tomatoes. It was a great tomato ranking, and that was one of the worst Star Wars movies I and think I've ever seen. Down, yeah, like, and that was the opposite. Saying, like, the yeah, score was down. I, and I can agree with you, man. I can agree with you. I think it's 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 usually, a, usually the critics are good. Like if the critics, like you know, uh, Infinity War, 
critics are like 98 or critics are like 94 and the fans are 96 so like that when that happens you know like oh man this movie rocks yeah the critics are high and the fans are low that and you're a fan of the movie that's coming out it's just weird or other way around so yeah it's weird yeah, it's a, a listen, it's a good point. I, I'll, I'll definitely look at. I already know what happens. I had a, I had a read up on this because, like, I'm a fan of the series. I wanted to see what I'm jumping in myself into, so I kind of know what occurs anyway. Um, but I'm like, okay, like, there's some things I don't agree with. So let's see when we get there. Let's jump into the next topic here. Uh, Sonic Frontiers. So IGN had a sit down interview with Ian Flynn, who was the story writer for the new Sonic Frontiers game. So essentially in the interview, he talks about the story because that trailer they gave you did not give you a single inkling of what the story was going to be. And it kind of, the game kind of looked like it was very unfinished. Like, and essentially what they're uh, planning for was the game to come out this year, but I don't think it will. I think it'll come out next year. But essentially Ian uh, says that the story is, is pretty basic. It starts out with Sonic, Tails and Amy are investigating the disappearance of Chaos Emeralds. Some crazy stuff happens. And now Sonic is left alone on this open zone island where he needs to find out what the hell happened, as well as what's going on with his friends. Um, and on top of that, the story is going to be extremely open to the point where it's not linear. Like, it's very, you can kind of do certain things at certain times, whatever you want, essentially. Like, following in that open world, you know, mentality. And, you know, obviously, open world is the flavor of the, of the you know, decade, essentially. Yeah. Um, it's basically every game is trying to now become an open world in some aspect, including Halo and uh, as well as others, uh, trying to take open world elements so the question i have for you guys is how do you know what do you think sonic frontiers needs to do to be a successful open world game because we played a boatload of these types of open worlds and you know each one's different in their own way but what what do they need to do to be a successful one and i'll talk with hockey first here what do you think is essential that sonic frontiers needs to do to be a successful open world game? Yeah, so um, let me just first start off, and I'm sure Chad knows this by now. You guys obviously know this by now. I've always been a first-person, almost only shooter. Um, You've been converted. I, uh, yeah, I have now opened my mind, and I know my one of my <laughs> boys, D. Rob, has been trying to open up my eyes for the last uh, you know four or five years, and I opened it with Elden Ring. Um, seeing the little playthrough that they had uh, given us, I think it was uh, probably a few weeks ago, um, looked good. Um, my biggest thing is, uh, and again, I'm probably going to scoop this game as soon as it comes out, but the biggest thing again, and I know we're all in agreement is just staying to the core of what a Sonic game is. And again, I'm not super update updated to what that is. I know you guys are, so I'm assuming if they stay to, you know, the core of what a Sonic game is, um, make it fun. Uh, and again, in an open world, it could get boring quick. Right, so you have to get fun, and if you stick to the core of a Sonic game, which huge fan base, you know, you so you stick to the core of the Sonic game, uh, you make a good story, and uh, you make it fun and entertaining in that open world. I think this game would be really, really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I can agree with you there, hockey. I think Sonic's a, is a platformer, so you gotta have to kind of find that platformer formula that goes with open world. And Langelica, I'll let you jump in, and then I'll finish off with the my own opinion. So what do you think? Again, you know, we've talked about this and we've all kind of dug deep into open worlds and there's different kinds of open worlds, right? I mean, you can go into a vast, you know, open world where you can pretty much walk to the final boss if you want to. Games like Elden Ring and Breath of the Wild, um, Witcher and stuff like that. Or there's kind of more controlled open worlds, similar like Halo Infinite, a Ghost of Toshima. Um, I'm interested to see what kind of lane Sonic goes into. But again, the core thing, and, and Aki mentioned it earlier, the core thing of Sonic, right? Speed, anti-gravity stuff. You know, like there's some wild supposed to be movements when you're Sonic um, that make it interesting. And it's, it's, it's a real tough dynamic to do it in an open world setting, to be quite honest with you, unless there's an open world and then leading into certain dungeons that you kind of get that platformer vibe from Sonic. So I'm very interested to see what they do. I would probably lean more towards the controlled open world and not just the free reign open world like Elden Ring and Breath of the Wild. I would probably do more of a Ghost, to Ghost of Toshima type of thing um, until they can prove that, that they can handle, Sonic at least can handle this open world stuff. Yeah, now listen, I think if you're looking for a formula, follow Mario Odyssey. I mean, 
They kind of did it perfectly. They That's have one, yeah. they they essentially what they did was they copied Banjo Kazooie in a lot of ways and said, all right, it's a controlled open world where we have you know we're gonna go to pick a, an area and this area is pretty massive. There's a lot of stuff for you to go find and go do in these side missions inside these in this in this world and each world is different in their themes and things like that. And they kind of said, all right, go out and go find this stuff and then move on to the next world whenever you get a certain number of, of moons, but uh, stars or whatever you want to call it. And so Sonic, in my opinion, would do probably wonders if they followed in that mantra where yeah. they have this great greenery area, this island that is kind of a portal to a bunch of other islands and other areas that will now open up to be more Sonic based levels. Because like you said, Langelica, like Sonic is is a platformer right and i said this before too sonic's a platformer it, you gotta find those roots because if you don't have those roots in platformer games then a lot of those original fans of the series might kind of be annoyed because this is not sonic then it's like a brand new character brand new game and that's what you're appealing you're appealing to sonic fans as well as you're trying to include new people to the audience yeah. as, as well but you know sonic fans are the ones that are going to be most loyal like the, the people of my yeah, age i think you know i think that odyssey formula makes a lot of sense That'd be perfect because then you can make those areas like speed, like speed areas, or even like yeah. you have to be get that gravity areas, like stuff that specific things you want them to do most of the time, and just have it roll with that. Have all the rings, have like you know all that you can have side bosses, have all that stuff. I think that'd be interesting for Sonic. And I, I, I honestly, I'm really hoping that Sonic has a good game. You know, they they they've been dreadful. There's been a lot of dreadful Sonic games out there, and just recently with all the success that the movie has. You have, you're kind of rooting for Sonic. I mean, you're like, yeah. if I'm picking between like like Mario and and, and and Sonic, like I'm picking Mario. Like Mario's my guy. I mean, but at the end of the day, Sonic is a legendary character. He's like, he's he was battling with Mario for such a long time that you know Mario ended up winning, obviously, and Sega was ended up being purchased by Nintendo. But at the end of the day, Sonic is up there as one of the legendary game characters as of all time, right? So you want to give him his due. You want to give him his game that gets him back in the limelight again and i hope he does i hope sonic does get that la that game that pushes him back in let's jump to the next topic guys final fantasy 7 rebirth was revealed at the final fantasy 25th anniversary event so square enix uh, being the legendary and fast-paced company as we all know them to be essentially announced the next installment of the quote-unquote trilogy i'm i'm being sarcastic by the way um they let's just be honest they don't make games in a very fast fashion they are very slow and do not make games that we want them to make so square enix has made this game a trilogy it's no longer just you know let's just push out part one and part two of final fantasy let's squeeze the hell out of this thing as much as humanly possible and let's make this a three-parter not a two-parter like they said originally a three-parter let's make this into three sections so we can really get you to feel the environment of final fantasy 7 where essentially yeah. back in 1996 I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact date but 1996 from what i remember was when final fantasy 7 came out originally and guess what it came complete with everything in it. it didn't have one section in here and then a second part of the two years later it's all three sections were in one freaking game and that was it and everyone's gonna say well it's an updated game a ps5 you know how much easier it is to make a game nowadays compared to what it was when you have to use freaking blocks? You're making blocks and putting blocks in computer designs with Macs that were the size of my television making games. Like, like, like you know, it, so me getting out of, uh, off track here, essentially what they did was they showed a trailer that showed, uh, you know, the first part was it's part of the story where, where Cloud is walking aside Sephiroth. And then in the second part of the trailer it shows Cloud hurt basically being carried by another major character in final fantasy 7 series which was final fantasy from final fantasy crisis core the protagonist zach fair now basically this this does bring a lot of hype to the game because final fantasy 7 remake was very good in my opinion i thought they did a very good job at updating the game to, to combat that makes it more appealing to more people you know i'm a fan of kingdom hearts this is a square enix game that they that they basically show little attention to essentially and they basically copied that combat system uh, to a degree and kind of revamped it to and the match newer final fantasies yeah they had newer final fantasies matched yeah. with the kingdom Hearts style and made it into final fantasy 7 remakes game game type and it was really good i liked the way that it played it looked really good um and it was fun uh and obviously final fantasy 7 is a legendary game so the story is there 
The downside is, and this is where a lot of people get fearful of, is that there will be some adjustments because they just need to make adjustments or some like changes to the story aspect or dialogue, which they sh really shouldn't. They should just keep it consistent. Um, but basically, they also stated that remakes of Crisis Core will be on all platforms as well, which is obviously pretty big for all consoles. But Final Fantasy VII, uh, uh, you know, Rebirth is not going to be on Xbox, at least for the foreseeable future. So that is a big deal for obviously PlayStation 5 fans because you know that that's that's exclusive, right? So another exclusive is going to be added to the to the to the repertoire, but. My big question, and uh, I, I want to see what you're... I think we're all excited for a new installment of this game because Final Fantasy VII is, is a great game. You know, it's a great game in general. But I kind of want to get your opinion about... Because I just talked about this remake thing where now they're changing it into being a two-parter because, you know, cr there's crazy stuff going on and they need to make sure everything's finished. But are you annoyed that this is a trilogy or, you know, would you rather just be released complete? Like, or at least make it a two-parter. Like, what do you guys think about this? And... I'll start with you, Lou Jellicill. Are you annoyed that this is a uh, trilogy remake now and not a just a regular game as as was and just remake it? Um, I'm just gonna start off by saying Square Enix is one of and you know I joke with Marsman off camera a lot. Square Enix is one of my most hated developers uh, in the gaming industry, and it's not because I think they're as bad as some of these other ones as and they make bad games. My frustration with them is that. Um, like, I want to really like them. I, I want to say that they're one of the better developers, but they just do things that drive me crazy. And this is kind of one of them. Um, they're one of the best juicers in the game gaming industry when it comes to squeezing series for as much money as possible. And, and this is a great aspect of it. Final Fantasy VII, the remake, was one of the, the rare examples of re, like reinventing a game, a legendary game, and it worked. And the game played well, the graphics looked great, but when you get to the end of the game, you're, you're kind of like, whoa, wait, the game ended? As in, like, damn, like, this just feels like it abruptly ended, and then you're saying, okay, we're waiting for part two. Part two takes forever to come here, and now they're saying, actually, they're going to cut part two into two parts. So it's going to be part two and part three, and they're all going to be, you know, at least 60, right? So that's the part where it's just crazy. And they did this with Kingdom Hearts 2.5, 2.8, 2. 2. point, you know, like they, they had every Kingdom Hearts in between installments possible. Um, and it's a shame because I do think that they, at times, and a good amount of times, make a very strong game, right? I'm a fan of the Kingdom Hearts. I'm a fan of their Final Fantasy games. Some of them have been tremendous. Some of the new ones have been really good. The online one, like Square Enix at times does some really good stuff, but they do these kind of things that just drive me crazy. And I am annoyed from it. I, uh, To me, I still stand by the rule that if it's not done, delay it. Um, so I want a complete game. But again, this kind of stuff annoys me. Hey, Hockey, what do you think? I know you're the, you are the anti remake. Let's just make a brand new game type of thing. How do you feel about this, man? Yeah, I mean, unless so, uh, unless they didn't have the tail of the, like the the end of the game ready, wh why would they make a part three unless they have to continue to work on the, you know, the whole game which they were gonna remake? So uh, for them to just cut it up uh, and charge, you know, sixty to seventy dollars for the first one, and then hopefully it's not another two or three years until we get the third one, you know, because um, I'm gonna start hopping on the Final Fantasy. I've, um, I have not played, but I've seen uh, D. Uh, used to, you know, uh, watch uh, one of my boys, D. Rob, play it, and it is a fantastic game. So um, I know of the series, a very iconic series, one of the best, uh, I think, exclusive installments that PS5 does um, have, or usually they are, uh, you know, exclusive. Um, but yeah, I mean, to to cut it into three pieces, what that tells me is that you didn't have the tail end of the game uh, completed, and although it might be a very long game. You just uh, charge us another 60 bucks. It's just kind of ridiculous. And, and I'll kind of finish my, my thought on this. And I already kind of went on my mini rant there. But just it's just ridiculous that Square Enix does this often. This is not a new thing that they just started doing. Langelic Hill mentioned is we're fans of Kingdom Hearts. We've been playing that game since we were kids. And they've been either, one, stretching every title to be a .5 version of it. To, to just not give you a full game, but give you like... You know other installments combined to make it or take a decade to make a new game because they'd rather 
you squeeze the crap out of you until you're frustrated and then they finally give you an inkling of a new game and then you play it and you're like this is not what I what I want. I want more, right? And then all of a sudden, like, well, you have to wait another well, decade. Coming. Like, the next like part yeah, it's going to wait another decade yeah. because because we got so much other stuff. And and Square Enix obviously knows that their more popular series is is Final Fantasy. I mean, yeah. that's they they we all know that. Like Square Enix is known for Final Fantasy. Now they do have some other titles that they're making, but that's their big money one. And you're telling me that they aren't dishing all the resources to finishing this Final Fantasy VII. I doubt it. I know that what they're doing is essentially it's so popular right now that we just need to squeeze the crap out of it. Because I know what's going to come next. I can guarantee I, this happens. They're going to make a Final Fantasy, you know, uh, premium final cut or something. That's like a the first part and part two combined. And that's going to be just like you get to play both parts together in one full story with some bonus content we add. So you can make, it'll be fresh and updated. And you're gonna sit there and pay another forty to fifty to sixty dollars yeah. for this new combined edition that all it does is Final it just Fantasy puts the game 7.8. It puts them together, puts them together, and <laughs> just makes it consistent. Like it's an actual Final full Fantasy game. 7.8. Yeah, seven point seven point eight to put two games together. Part one and part then two, yeah. it says, Well, if you play the legend the harder edition, the proud mode, you'll get a trailer for the third part. For part and you're three. like yeah. And we already, and like at the end of the day, we already know how the damn story ends. This is not yeah. something new. This game came out 20 years ago. All right, just make a full freaking game. And I get it. You're taking a game, changing the mechanics, and you're putting out a new one. I get it. Like you're not taking the the uh, you know strategy or a turn based shooter basically. Like you're not a uh, shooter, but turn based combat. You're not doing that. I I get that. But come on now. Like you're you're like we're squeezing the crap out of this series and. It's a it's a great game. You know, it's a great game. You're just squeezing the crap out of it. You're like, and people are telling me like, well, they gotta charge seventy because it's so it just looks look so nice. They don't have to charge seventy for that. It's a remake. They're not creating something brand new. They're not making a new idea out of their freaking minds. It's a new game mechanic. It's the same story essentially. Don't 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 give me that BS for charging seventy. Like that doesn't make any sense. I I always say this, and I've been consistent. Anything that's a remake remaster should be cheaper 40 bucks maximum for that thing it's a you're taking an old game rehashing it and selling it back to me if i already own a rematch of the older version of the game you can't tell me i should pay extra for something that is just revamped it looks better like that that makes no sense to me and that and that goes for everyone that, that doesn't just go for playstation ones because they've been doing a lot of those recently anything like a, Ma a, a master chief collection should not have been an entire 60 bucks like all that game all you did was just connect them together right and it it launched horribly so you can't even give me tell me 60 bucks for that makes sense or uh they make a, Ma a marcus phoenix uh, collection you're taking three marcus phoenix games combining them from a decade plus ago and saying oh here's a brand new game here's 70 bucks or 60 dollars you gotta change your charge for that like no i can literally individually play those games that i already own play them or like whatever and and not have to pay 60 bucks for them. like that so let's be real Everyone does it. It's a it's annoying and frustrating. Just let's just have the game and pay less for it, please. Like, come on now. Um, final question. This comes from our Discord. Um, this is a question, and I it, I think this will be pretty quick. But and I already answered this before, so I'll let you guys give your opinions. What are your thoughts about Mario Strikers Battle League, and do you think it's worth buying? Um, I already made an entire review of this, so. Please go and check out that review, and that is in the description below. That is also on the Vendetta Sports Media that I'm also partnered with now. But I'll let you guys kind of give your opinion since you didn't get to be included in that review. So let's start off with Hockey. You've been playing this game quite a lot. What is your? Is this worth buying? What do you think about this game? Yeah. So um, I mean, this is the first uh, Mario Strikers that I've ever owned. Um, I used to play it. I'm pretty sure I played it at your guys' house. Um, again, I just bought the Switch. The Switch is awesome. I can't wait to buy more games for the Switch. Um, Mario Strikers was one of the first games that I bought, other than Breath of the Wild. And I think it is definitely worth it. Um, again, I'm not a sports guy, but this is a, a sports video game guy. But this is like a completely different, you know, it's not a, a real uh, like live action, you know, NCAA or Madden. Uh, it's cool mechanics. You know, you're playing with the uh, Mario and all the Nintendo characters. Um, I think it definitely is worth it. It's much fun. It's much more fun when you play with 
uh, friends and that online uh, club that you can that you can do. And I know Marsman has uh, his own club that we're all a part of. I think that's a very cool idea as well. Um, it could definitely be, you know, better, more characters, more variations of cups that you can play on your own. Or, you know, just just it could have more content. Again, um, I don't think I don't want to say it wasn't a complete game because th there's um, not a ton of wrong with it, but there could have been much more to the game. Uh, but I, I mean, I think Marsh gave him the eight. You know, um, right, Marsh? It was yours. Yep. Was, uh, it was, yeah, so mine, I'm going to give it like an 8-1 or an 8-2. I think it's a, a good game worth the 60 bucks. Um, you know, it's a different game. Yeah, so let's look at what do you think? Is this worth buying? Yeah, hockey, I think hockey really nailed it, and I definitely recommend everyone to go watch your review on it, your in-depth review. But to me, there's things that I really like and things that I really hate. Um, I think this is the best online, uh, functioning online for Wii, for the Wii, for Switch. Um, out of the games that have been out. I think it runs very smooth uh, for the most part um, compared to some of the other installments, uh, especially the last one. I think the Battle League having, uh, you know, kind of your own group is really fun. Playing with others is a lot of fun. I'll do, I, w I wish that they could create an a, a, a scenario where you can play with four people from different areas on the same team, right? So it doesn't have to be, two has to be split screen, and another two has to be split screen, right? I wish that they would give that option, um, which would be a little bit better. The things I hate, the characters. Haki mentioned it. Yeah, I find it, like, impossible with the Mario characters that we've seen in multiple games and in Mario Kart that we should be lacking characters at launch with 10. It's absolutely unacceptable. Um, it's, a, it's a knock on Nintendo, in my opinion. And the second thing, Damn, Nintendo really dove into the microtransaction BS with their stupid stadiums being like ridiculously priced. The stadiums, there's not enough that you feel, okay, it's worth this unbelievable grind that I have to go through. Um, so those two things, again, not really a microtransaction, but they just make the grind this so is grind, brutal. grind, yeah. Yeah, they make the grind so brutal. And I wish they just had more because the core, and we talk about this a lot, core gameplay core fun aspect is worth it i do think it's fun. i had a lot of fun when i played it with you guys um and i do think that it, it is a, a replayable game um playing with others but it's just that hey it's right there you mm -hmm. know like why shortchange the fans um and they can fix it depending on how good their live service is i give it a 7.8 i do think it's a worthwhile game um i'm not going to give it to the eights just because the lack of characters to me is just gross um, and that's why it can't get over an A for me. I got you. I got you. Well, listen, guys, I, if you want to submit a question for next week's show, then please make sure you join us on Discord and submit your questions there, as well as you can submit your highlights for the next upcoming highlight tape. And I do that one. I do a new highlight tape for every single month. So obviously, if you have any highlights for the month of June, you need to make sure you join us on YouTube skip by subscribing and giving us a thumbs up and Make sure you submit your highlights on Discord and we'll be good to go. But thank you guys for watching. This is Marsman from Marsman Gaming. We're signing off for the night, guys. Peace out. <laughs>